it's such an honor to be here. Um, when I was invited to come and speak, I can't explain how excited I was um, at this opportunity to, to meet everybody and to uh, talk a little bit about my research and, and how I got to this point. And I started looking and finding where these stories were. They were nowhere. And I started diving into collections and I started going to different places, looking at online resources, and I could not find these stories. And I was like, wow, I have found original, really untapped research. And then I thought, if there are these stories, and so many people wrote about going through this time period, there's got to be more. Maybe there's online in these old newspaper clippings and stuff that they were creating with digital archives was really developing at that time. And I was like, well, just maybe there's more to build a bigger story, to kind of give the reader a seat in this time period in Mobile, to kind of make it so that the reader is experiencing the Civil War in Mobile at the same time as the people that they're reading about. So I found more and more research and then I started placing it according to month. January, February, March, January, whenever it was a dismal Christmas for one young lady who was in the city. She couldn't leave. The city was locked down or one period where there was a gentleman who's a unionist in Mobile, but he can't leave. He can't go anywhere. And the Confederacy is conscripting soldiers, and they're conscripting young men as young as 12 and 13, and they need to have soldiers to fight, and the war is at an end, and they're <coughs> struggling to find people. So he squirrels his son away into the woods, and then the son is hiding in the woods for a period of time. And then he hides his son on a carriage. While everybody's in church on Sunday, he puts his son on the carriage and, scare, and hides him, puts him out onto a steamship that is going to brave the blockade in Mobile. Does he make it? You'll have to read the book to find it. Not only is there his story, there's the story of Joseph Block, a Jewish man in Mobile. He was known as Mobile's father of music, and he um, met his wife. He, he actually escaped from persecution in Germany, came to America, when was on a boat on his way to New Orleans for a brand new life. He was a very talented musician, but he was kind of stuck. He didn't know what to do with himself. So he got off this boat at, at Bienville Square in Mobile, and everybody knows about Bienville Square in Mobile, it's like the place to be. He saw his wife across the park, and he said, that's the woman I'm gonna marry. So he skipped the boat passage, marries his wife, and he ends up playing music in Mobile during the Civil War, and during this time period. And Mobile, they're a little quirky. They did not stop balls. They did not stop partying. They did not stop their social gatherings all through the war. And so he was one of the musicians who played during that time period. And then there's the story of a woman. She loved everybody. She was internationally known. <coughs> she was only introduced to Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Um, she only had friends with everybody. Only Henry Clay was a personal friend. Um, that's, that's all. She had just met Prince Albert just before the war began. She was at a ball with Prince Albert and shared his uh, box, which was a big scandal. Um, so she was exposed to a highest of society, not only in Mobile, but throughout the country. Her grandfather signed the Declaration of Independence, her father, anybody heard of Fort Walton Beach, Florida? Yeah. Okay, that was named after George Walton Jr. And that was her father. Her name was Madame Octavia Walton Levert. 
And in Mobile Under Siege is where I first discovered Octavia Walton River. And that's where the next book I wrote, and it's for sale here today, and I believe I'm going to come back and talk about her at another day. Yes, she is. She's going to come okay. and do a tea. <laughs> yeah, so um, Octavia Walton Liver, but she was in Mobile during this time period. She couldn't leave. Her husband was sick, dying. He died before the war was over. She had two children she had to take care of. The city was on lockdown. She couldn't go anywhere. She couldn't leave. They had actually um, opened the Levert Hospital. Has anybody heard of that? There's a lot of, okay, nobody up here has heard of the Levert Hospital. It was where the uh, commanders of the uh, Confederate Army would come to recover. Mobile's Dr. Levert and her Octavia's husband was a resource for the Confederate Army uh, during that time period because they needed, um, it was far enough away from the battle so that men could recover and go back to the front. Um, so a lot of soldiers came through Mobile and was in the Levert Hospital. I saw some of the records, the State Archives of Alabama has those records today. Um, her family were instrumental, they donated the money to support this hospital, but at the end of the war, because she was friends with everybody, Union and Confederate, at the end of the war, she welcomed the Union soldiers into her home, and it did go very well for her. You'll have to learn that story <laughs> in the book. <laughs> there is so much history in Mobile that I discovered just on this journey that just my book is the beginning. The other big discovery in researching Mobile Under Siege was I found a lot of stories that were kind of not included in other texts. And there were stories of women, of children, and the enslaved, and the Creoles. Mobile had a big Creole population, still has some Creoles still in the area, but back then it was much larger. And those stories also are just fascinating and revealing in so many ways. You see how people work together to survive. And in Mobile, that was a big thing. They had to team, work together to make it. And they did. So when you read Mobile Under Siege, I hope, and so many people have, the reviews have been great. I hope that you too will experience life like it was. Now when I write, I'm a librarian, as y'all know, and I've said, but I'm all encompassing. So when I write a story or I write a book, whenever I tell you the story, the story's not just there. I want you to understand the big picture. I want you to walk on the streets. I want you to feel the feelings. I want you to experience what these people, as close as I could possibly get, and I use historical research to do this. So, thank you so much for having me. I am available for questions. Uh, feel free to ask me anything and everything. And thank you for your time. And thank you for being here. And in learning a little bit more about people who could have been forgotten to history if it wasn't for you today. So thank you.